My name is Rodika Vornik. I'm an associate policy director at Carbon Gap, and I'm super, super privileged to be moderating this panel conversation today on a very, very important topic. Um, but by a show of hands, how many of you were upstairs in the compliance markets panel? Okay, good. And then the rest were downstairs. Another show of hands? Okay, great. So those were the pillars number two and number three of our uh, vision for a CDR strategy. Now we're going to take a step back to take many steps further. Uh, and we're going to discuss how to target EU funding to scale up CDR research, development and innovation. But before we delve into that topic, I would like to give a big thanks to one of our colleagues who unfortunately is not here today, but I know she's watching us actually online. Eloisa, thank you so much. She's been leading the work on this panel. So a round of applause maybe for our colleague Eloisa Villoria. Thank you. So as you've heard earlier in Sylvain's presentation, um, at the heart of our discussion today is, I mean, funding for research and development and innovation for carbon removal. And in simple words, European and global cl climate targets will not be met without assembling a diverse portfolio of carbon removal methods that are able to deliver at scale. Um, the issue is that some novel and promising CDR methods, such we can think of enhanced rock weathering, for instance, ocean CDR and so on, are still at an early development stage, and they need targeted research and innovation support to further mature and address pending questions. The EU has already committed to deploying a significant amount of CDR and is among the world's leader in addressing climate change. Yet, its research and innovation funding plans for CDR do not reflect this level of ambition from our perspective. So we've had a look into it, and between 2020 and 2023, the EU directly supported CDR research and innovation with a disbursement of approximately uh, 613 million euro among mechanisms such as Horizon Euro, uh, the, uh, Europe, sorry, the Innovation Fund, and the EIC, which is only 0.1% of the EU's budget for the green transition. So this is the setup of our conversation today with our esteemed speakers. Um, so during this session, we'd like to answer three big questions. The first one is related to addressing the research gaps. So what research gaps remain to be addressed among carbon removal methods? And what role does research development and innovation funding plays in closing these gaps? The second question is around strategic alignment. So ca how can we best align the funding support available in the EU to ensure that it is well targeted and coordinated across the different methods, CDR methods? And lastly, financial commitment. How can we manage to expand the budget for carbon removal, uh, research development and innovation? Um, I'm sure you have a lot of questions and there will be an opportunity to engage with our panelists. So there will be a Q&A towards the end of, uh, of our panel. Um, and there's one more important person in the room that you cannot see on the panel, but that's our rapporteur, that's Lina Nagel from Bellona Europa. Uh, she's right here, she's going to be taking note of the conversation and during the plenary session afterwards, she will deliver the outcomes of this session uh, that will take place now. And I think I've said enough, now let's go to our panelists. So we'll start with Jeroen Scoopers, a senior expert at DG Research and Innovation at the European Commission. So Jeroen, um, the European Commission has been supporting carbon capture and storage projects for a while now, but we can also observe now a recent focus on carbon dioxide removal. How has the research and innovation landscape for CDR evolved and why is this necessary now? Thank you. Thank you, Rodi, guys. Uh, interesting to, uh, to discuss this topic here today. Um, we have indeed quite a long history in CCS, uh, not so much CDR yet, but CCS, and that started about 30 years ago. And I spoke this morning to a, a colleague from Equinor, uh, the previous Stat Oil. I think that's where it all started 30 years ago, uh, when they started uh, storing CO2 from their gas field in an aquifer. And that started first European projects as a satellite around that. Um, since then, we have seen uh, the emergence of European CCS program, focusing very much on CCS, first of all, in the, uh, the power sector, coal and gas-fired power plants. Um, that was the idea at the time. Um, gradually, when we, when we of course, uh, saw the renewables taking a fast steps forward, 
um, the power industry had more and more options to decarbonize without CCS. So we, we shifted the attention to the hard to bait industries that we heard a lot about already in previous, uh, previous talks. So the, the cement and the steel and the refineries. And we, that was reflected in the research program and we see that now as a success story, I think, reflected in the results of the innovation fund uh, where Ale uh, Alexandre Paco referred to uh, early this morning in his opening speech. The last call, 2023, of the Innovation Fund has five projects in the cement industry that take the full chain from capture to transport to storage. So that is a real success. Um, CDR uh, as a technology has been mainly supported in the past by the Marie Curie actions and the support to SMEs because these are not the big players like you have in CCS, it's the smaller players and that's a big difference. Um, but we have seen gradually a cross-fertilization between CDR and CCS, and we saw that already starting in Horizon 2020, when we had a project on Iceland called Carpfix, where they capture CO2 from a geothermal power plant and dissolve it in water and inject it in basalt for a fast mineralization within, let's say, one or two years. And now they added a CDR module next to this from Climeworks, a Swiss company, a direct air capture unit, and this is scaled up through Horizon Europe, but also now recently in the innovation fund where this is supported as well. So we see this, uh, this, uh, this growing, that the landscape has changed. And we see that as well reflected in this uh, recent communication on uh, carbon dioxide review for industrial carbon management, where this is one of the three technologies mentioned. Um, I think what we see, uh, the importance of this is that we are now able to build a pipeline of investable projects by capturing the whole chain from low TRL technology readiness levels towards commercialization because our challenge is in each part of the chain. And I think this is now, that landscape starts to develop now. Back to you. Great, thank you so much. A lot of interested thoughts that I will follow up immediately afterwards. Uh, but for now, we're going, going to go to our next speaker. That's Philippe Sier, Associate Director at the Laboratoire des Sciences du Climat et de l'Environnement. Sorry, my, my not ideal French. Um, our question to you to kick off is, could you elaborate a bit on the challenges um, that the research community is facing when navigating EU procedures for CDR funding and what improvements could be done as well. Thank you. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you for the question. Well, as a research scientist, I'm more a user of research funding. And uh, well, in short, uh, it's more kind of bottom-up view uh, or intuitive view of the situation rather than a kind of full analytics of the funding which is dedicated to CDR now. But I have the impression, and in short, you know, it's like could do better or even could do much better. Why? Uh, maybe for different reasons. First of all, the volume seems to be very low compared to the stakes. Uh, I think the total volume, from what I read from the Carbon Gap website, of dedicated like CDR direct funding is 1%. If you add the indirect effect, like you know, transport of CO2, uh, geological capabilities, you might double this amount. But this is still incredibly small compared to the stakes, because we know that our global budget for remaining below 1.5 degree warming is exhausted virtually. So we want to do 1.5 degree without an overshoot. Say that, OK, overshoot, yes. But overshoot means CDR. I mean, you can't decrease CO2 after a peak if you don't have CDR in play. It's virtually impossible. And uh, honestly, you know, uh, I'm not very optimistic uh, about 1.5 degree, and uh, we are even facing the risk to overpass 2 degree, right? Uh, so I think that mainly the funding is highly fragmented. You will find probably a task or work package dealing with CDR in, you know, integrated assessment and climate policy cost benefit scenarios in earth system model developments, because we need to understand the earth system response to CDR technologies, in all kind of agricultural, climate smart agriculture, and ecosystem-based, you know, natural-based solutions, without speaking of all the kind of technological, uh, you know, green uh, uh, transition and uh, uh, energy uh, uh, projects. So it's so fragmented that I believe that for a decision maker uh, that has funded this project, it's very difficult to get an outcome, okay, what did we learn across, you know, 200 projects about CDR? You know, the supply, the barriers, the offer, the different technologies. 
so that makes it difficult. Secondly, uh, maybe I found that, uh, at least from my personal experience, that uh, funding is also diluting CDR into things which look like CDR but are not quite like CDR. Like CCS, okay, is basically does nothing to atmospheric CO2. It's a void emission. It doesn't reduce this CO2. It doesn't cool the climate. It just avoids warming. CCU is a kind of reuse of CO2, but in the end, it will kick out CO2 in the atmosphere. And sometimes, you know, these technologies are confused, and CDR uh, task or research is kind of mixed or diluted with those uh, uh, other technologies. Uh, thirdly, maybe uh, because of the fragmentation, uh, I also found that uh, funding on CDR uh, is a kind of broken line between uh, uh, you know, the fundamental research about how much CDR do we need to meet a certain climate target, uh, and the uh, on-the-ground work on pilots and technologies. Typically, you know, as a climate researcher, I need a marginal abatement of cost curve for a range of technologies. You know, I find them from the literature, but I guess, you know, my own cost abatement assessment are completely disconnected from practitioners working on CDR on the ground. And I feel that we need to bridge this gap to, to make things happen. So that would be my, you know, few words about uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, intuitive vision of uh, the current situation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Philippe. Um, we'll go next to uh, Lee Beck, uh, Senior Director, Europe and Middle East at the Clean Air Task Force. So, Lee, there is a need of alignment between research development and innovation and deployment of CDR technologies and methods. How can that be reflected in EU funding? Yeah, thanks, Rodika, for having me on this panel. Thanks to Carbon Gap. And congratulations for launching this incredible report, which I think provides a lot of clarity on a strategic policy approach for scaling CDR. So I just wanted to congratulate everyone at Carbon Gap for this. Um, for those of you who don't know, Clean Air Task Force, we're a global climate organization focusing on technology optionality, so um, bringing as many um, options, technology options, climate mitigation, and CDR options um, to scale as possible across the globe. And um, so we work on a range of technologies, not just CDR. Um, in Europe, we've been focusing on the CRCF, of course, together with other NGOs, including Carbon Gap. We've also worked on the industrial carbon management strategy and ensured that um, carbon removal is appropriately represented there. Um, alongside a range of collaborations. And I think recently we took a step back because at Clean Air Task Force we're really interested to understand how do we actually, how have we scaled technologies in the past or options slash solutions and what can we learn from these approaches so we can don't necessarily repeat the same patterns but actually apply as we're going through new policy formulation um, those lessons. And so I want to take a step back and really think about, okay, when we're scaling options or solutions slash technologies, um, we really are going through a process. We need to reduce costs. We need to enable financing. We need to have repeated projects, not just, you know, 200 times the first of a kind and then nothing. We need to create ecosystem co conditions so have the space, um, the infrastructure necessarily for direct air capture, for example, 24-7, 365 of clean electricity. But it's really, as we're thinking through, you know, as technologies kind of start to, they're conceptualized and they are deployed and then they kind of, as, you know, mature and, and uh, plateau as they scale. So the role of R&D is not just in the beginning, and that's what we've often gotten wrong, or governments have often gotten wrong. They think of R&D as this thing that happens in the beginning, and then kind of it, it trickles out. It is important in the beginning, but it's important to have continuous CD, um, R&D to ensure that we're reducing costs, we're innovating process, we're mining efficiencies, we're understanding. It's hugely important as an input to planning where we should be even doing which solutions from an efficiency because Europe is highly um, land um, dense. And so one of our forthcoming reports um, looks at AMPS. This is an interesting acronym. Um, 
talk to Cody Moore, who's here in the front row, uh, about it. But it's additionality, measurement, permanence, and scalability. And R&D should look at all of these because all of these have tensions and different tensions for different solutions. So for DAC, costs inhibits scalability, but R&D can help us understand how we can reduce costs. For example, let's take enhanced rock weathering, then you're really looking at the measurability and the permanence question. So it's really important that we're looking at R&D and formulating R&D policy in a way that actually thinks through how can we most efficiently scale these options and solutions. So I'm looking forward to this discussion. I'll stop here. But thank you very much. Thank you, Lee. And we're looking forward to read the report. Cody, I'll talk to you about it. Um, um, last but not least, uh, Megan Kempf, uh, head of tech carbon dioxide removals at South Pole. Um, the question would be around the role of the private sector in all this and how can the EU mobilize the private sector and the private sector funding to help scale up CDI? Thank Wicked, you. thank you. And thanks very much for having me. Um, so I think the role of the private sector really needs to be considered in what do we need to do at speed. That's something the private sector can do, especially facilitated by the EU, quicker than maybe member states can move. So in the next five years, we need to create a framework or create the conditions for a commodities market, enough volume of high durability removals, and so we need to act now to create a portfolio approach, as we've spoken about before. We need to migrate from that small level companies acting on the voluntary carbon market to at scale businesses. And this really speaks to what you were saying, Lee, about R&D through that process. And then we need to bridge between what is, what's the voluntary carbon market doing now and how are the credits that are going to be bought today how will they be used on a, a market like the ETS or a specific removals program? And so this is where you really need the private sector, thinking about the, the speed and the scale. And I think, let's look at the gap in funding, right? You mentioned, Rodica, that it's 613 million has been paid to date, looking around three to six billion that's needed over the next 15 years. This is not going to come yet, even if we get funding from the New Horizon Europe. That's not coming in until 2027. And then EU member states often don't have the, the fundamental like, ability to, to access that funding now or to set frameworks um, without the EU's action. So how, how can the EU actually act to, to move this capital from private sector? I think... They can do a few things. Like, what does the private sector need? It needs uh, clarity. And I think Paolo, who's not in the room, he was talking about this a lot on our last panel. And, um, and reduce risk. So clarity can come from the CRCF. It can come from an EU strategy. Um, and moves are starting to be made there. And, and certainly as we talk to, to private sector actors all the time, I work for South Pole, but our major um, move in the removals market is next gen which is an advanced buyer's facility. So we, uh, we think about uh, buyers all the time and what they need. They're trying to invest in the market now. They're very confused. They can't see what's, what, where are we aiming for and, and what, are we, what are we trying to do. So that clarity. And then de-risking initiatives. And this is really around how can the EU facilitate public-private partnerships. And a big thing that the EU already does is the, the business platform. So... We've seen that announced on the European Battery Alliance. We've seen that announced um, in, as part of the hydrogen strategy. How can you simplify access to funding, which would especially speak to your points, Philippe, and then also de-risk that initial funding, so create a sort of first loss capital position. And then where the private sector can have a lot of impact on beyond that initial R&D and into scaling is through the EU leading on some sort of procurement pilot. So look at what the US is doing. With only 35 million, they're able to take this leadership position. They've already just been matched by Google. You're able to, to move the private sector for a relatively small amount of money. Um, and that, that's a, a really clear signal and a really clear demand signal that we can use then to test for companies to test scaling and to test that, that scale up technology that we need. Thank you. Couldn't have said it better ourselves. Um, I'll go back to Jeroen for now. Um, questions around 
we've touched upon that, but what are the concrete EU funding opportunities for CDR that are available at the moment? And I mean, we've heard that maybe they're not um, net, like the full amount that we would need, uh, not sufficient. So what other options could be envisioned? And do you have any reactions to what was said by the other colleagues now? Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Shirley. Um, we have, of course, uh, our main instrument for us is Horizon Europe, which um, has a limited budget as you compare to an innovation fund, but nevertheless, we support the CDR through uh, the, the current calls that we have. We have the call in 2024 open, so it opens this year, with a topic uh, on direct air capture and bioenergy CCS. Um, we have supported this in different parts of the Horizon Europe as well, in climate parts, where it's more gener generic studies on the different the implications of carbon dioxide removal. But this is a topic that I mentioned on, on ducks and backs that we support through the energy program. Uh, this is where I come from. And of course, we have the Innovation Fund, which has a much larger budget, as mentioned this morning, it's about 40 billion euros. Uh, depends on the CO2 price, obviously, which is going down a bit now. But uh, and that is, uh, that is another one. Then we have a program which is called EU Breakthrough Catalyst, which is much less well known, uh, where the, all right, we put Horizon Europe money with Innovation Fund money and the EIB together with global philanthropic organizations, the Bill Gates Foundation, to get like $1 billion together in, in four technologies, five at the moment. One of them is CDR. The difficulties there that this program requires a cash flow within a few years back, which is difficult for CDR, obviously. Um, how can we improve? I think one thing to improve is uh, what we're already trying to do is to provide more synergies between the different programs and different steps because there is a gap between Horizon Europe and Innovation Fund. What we try to do is make sure the projects that we fund on Horizon Europe in their outputs uh, have the same, let's say, the, uh, the qualities that will allow them to apply for the innovation fund, for example, in terms of greenhouse gas calculation uh, methodologies, for instance. Um, another thing I think we should uh, make, uh, what I could mention is how can, we, how can we do better? We cannot increase funding so easily. Uh, the member states have just decided to decrease the Horizon Europe budget, so I mean, it goes in the wrong direction. Um, but having targets, having a strategy, having clarity, as was mentioned, is important for every technology. We had it for renewables, and this is why renewables have a high budget and easily defendable. For CCS, it's already much more under pressure, of course, uh, but uh, there we have some targets as well. So for CDR, having, having targets could help. Thank you very much. Um, Philippe, we've been talking a little bit about research gaps. From your perspective, what are the research gaps that remain to be addressed among carbon removal methods, and what role does, of course, funding can play in that? And if you could give some examples, that would be great as well. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I think, uh, well, some of the research gaps uh, relate to kind of uh, emerging CDR technologies, like enhanced weathering, biochars which uh, have not been really included in any uh, serious climate mitigation scenarios. So they are kind of, you know, people work on them, but there is very little uh, or insufficient knowledge to incorporate them at scale in, uh, you know, regional or global mitigation scenario. Another gap that I see is perhaps the fact that, uh, I mean, we produce a huge amount of knowledge and literature, which is fragmented in a lot of scientific uh, peer-reviewed publications, and it's impossible for you know decision makers, any normal human beings, to have a clear view of the uh, research outcome. And in a sense, for the climate research, I mean, uh, we have the IPCC, and the IPCC is producing you know a huge synthesis report that provides a summary for policymakers that convince, you know, essentially the essential messages uh, 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 that need to be taken into account. And I feel that we kind of miss this uh, uh, kind of integrative research, which can be based on uh, methods huh, which are well recognized, like in medical research, like meta-analysis, you know, data mining uh, is a powerful way to assess the efficiency of a medical treatment. Uh, and I believe those kind of, uh, you know, integrative uh, data mining, uh, meta-analysis methods uh, are very useful also to 
better compare different uh, uh, CDR uh, technologies uh, and their uh, possible uh, future pathways. So that would be my take on the research gaps, lack of, let's say, high-level dialogue between the scientific community and uh, decision makers who are going to implement or set targets, uh, lack of focused research on emerging CDR technologies in a changing world, and also maybe lack of a systematic you know, uh, integration and uh, uh, analysis of uh, existing data. And uh, well, when the EU wants something, you know, uh, it can have a good instrument to do it. Like I was involved a couple of years ago into a carbon monitoring strategy, uh, you know, and in a few years I was very impressed because the EU created a task force between different DGs and it brought up the European Space Agency, the European Center for uh, Middle Range uh, Weather Forecast, the scientific community, the GRC, I mean, all the important bodies. They created a task force and now they are going to launch, you know, uh, three or four uh, satellites for it's about half a billion euro program and have an operational system to monitor uh, greenhouse gas emissions and removals. And that was, you know, happening from scratch to uh, a real program that is part of the Copernicus program in two to three years. And I would like to see, you know, such a kind of phase transition happen also in the CDR domain. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you. Um, Megan, you did mention uh, with the situation at the global level, uh, so I'd have a follow-up. How would the current level of EU funding for CDR uh, in Europe compare to the estimated global funding requir requirements over the next two decades? And what are the potential consequences of such a disparity? Um, let me answer that in one second. I just want to add a tiny bit Perfect. to the research point. I think as well as all the very clear tech gaps and, and thinking about um, tech on a global scale and meta-analysis, I think there's also a real gap on actually how to govern this, what policy is needed, how to govern on a global scale, the strategy vies away, or your mention of the strategy vies away from anything to do with how do we think about international credits, how are we going to engage with different, different organizations from different countries on this, are we gonna buy international credits, how would you possibly manage that system? I think we need to do a lot of research there, and one way that we can do that is through trial and error and testing in member states under a very clear framework that the strategy would provide, that CRCF begins to provide. Um, so I think we can't forget that side. Um, thinking about the gap, so yeah, there's a, a huge gap between what's being spent now, um, to your point, the reduction in Horizon Europe is worrying. And I think, what does it mean? I mean, at the absolute most uh, catastrophic level. It means that if the European Union don't take a lead and don't fund removals now, we'll completely overshoot our climate goals. Um, at a less catastrophic level, it means that other countries um, and other groups of countries will step up, like we've seen the US do that now. I think that that works. You need lots of countries. There's a big role for the US to play as well as the European Union. But without um, developing an actual robust market that has uh, policy and funding and speedy deployment, I think it's going to be hard to see the European Union take then a leadership role on the regulatory side, on the certification side. And so we're going to have a lot less control on what is being sold and bought as carbon removals and what a high durability removal actually means, which I don't think we want to lose. Thank you. Maybe one last question, then we open the floor to the audience. Uh, and it's something that was mentioned a little bit um, and leads to you. But also, please, uh, all the others, uh, all the other panelists, feel free to, to contribute as well. Um, the situation at member state level and how can member states uh, enhance their commitments to CDR, both independently and in collaboration with the EU, uh, to make sure that we accelerate the development and deployment of CDR at scale. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for this question. Um, I just want to say that I think, again, we don't want to repeat the mistakes of the past, right? I think why, my favorite anecdote is when the US passed the Inflation Reduction Act, um, a lot of European countries in the EU, it's like, whoa, that's so much money. But is it really, if you're 
pulling together everything that the um, European member states and the EU spends on renewables, actually it was, compa it was pretty close. What was really going on is that w there was no overview of who's funding what, who's funding what in terms of infrastructure. There was lack of coordination. There's a big Burgle paper that was released about a year ago that I thought was very insightful for this. And actually, at Cleaner Task Force, we went on a um, kind of chase to, to, to categorize all the different funding mechanisms on the member state and EU level for different advanced energy tech. And our consultant threw their, their hands in the air and said, you know what, actually we can't do this. The languages, the, different, the differences in um, kind of funding, all of this is too complicated to actually give you a full and appropriate and accurate picture. So I think as we're getting started with C CDR now, right, this is why this strategy that you're proposing in agenda setting is so important because it needs to be streamlined so we're really most efficiently using every single dollar across European Union and member states and creating a kaleidoscope of different diverse policies that have the end goal in mind. And I think that's, that's really right. You can have um, research funding, you can have prizes, you have, can have grants, you can have ecosystem. All, um, as Lena likes to say, all mem member states have emissions, but not everyone has CO2 storage or enough land or enough electricity or enough... Um, ecosystem um, conditions to make CDR work everywhere. So it's really as a feed-in mechanism of, to planning, to planning across the union, I think R&D in a coordinated and strategic way is really, really important. So this would my, be my ask to um, the European Commission, but also to member state governments is really talk to your fellow governments, try to align, try to coordinate, and we as NGOs, as think tanks in the private sector, I'm sure as well, are here to support you with that. So I'll leave it at this, but I think this is my hope. Thank you for that call to action. And now it's your turn. Um, so we'll start with three questions. I hope there are three questions in the audience. Please raise your hand and my colleague, uh, yeah, I have somebody in the back. Um, somebody, yes, perfect. Please introduce yourself. Uh, yeah, hi, my name is Achim Hoffmann. Um, I'm a startup founder, MCDR in the UK. Um, my question is, uh, you, you might be biased on that answer. Um, I'm considering moving my venture to Germany um, because of Brexit and all the other problems and uh, the in Inflation Reduction Act on the one side and the Europe on the other. So uh, is there a pitch you can make to me <laughs> to, to come over? <laughs> Sorry, but then my second question is, in, in my previous life, uh, before I did what I'm doing now, I was a venture capital investor, early stage investment into university spin-outs in the UK. Horizon was always horrific. Um, it was, I, I was building hard tech companies from, from the universities, pre-seed, seed, round A, and I think the earliest we could really consider Horizon was like round B, round C, because then there was a team big enough in place to handle all the, the commitments uh, connected to this. And also the timelines, obviously, were usually like four or five years, six years, you have to plan in advance. And yeah. as a pre-seed, seed company, you're just in no position to, to think that far ahead. Your investors will not allow you to do that. Uh, well, I did not allow my companies to do that. Um, so I was just wondering, is there any movement happening on the European level to, to cut down timelines? Um, time in the past Thank didn't you. really have a lot of value, but, sorry, it, it, time in the past didn't have a lot of value. Now with climate, time has value. Absolutely. Thank you so much. To anyone in particular, is this question addressed, or to all the panelists? Uh, sir? Oh, sorry. Uh, is it a question to no, somebody no. in particular? Well, Everyone? No. Okay, fine. There was another does question in the back, yeah, thank you. Yeah, it does, yeah, it works. Yeah, my name is Peter Freeman, Texilla Capital. We specialize in uh, advising in strategy and funding tech companies in TRL 4 to 6, usually where nobody's there, we are there. And uh, I am in the process of associating with an ocean-based CDR company out of the States, out of my alma mater, UCLA, that would like to come to Europe. We have um, pilots running in the, in the States and in Singapore. And I would like to know what is the pathway, what do we have to do, or what do, what do we have to do to access European funding? I have an idea that we set up shop in Luxembourg, 
um, rather than in Germany or, or France, because of makes it easier. Uh, but then I would like to know from Jérôme what, um, how can we get into the European funding programs? The capital behind uh, my future client is consequential, but we need to set up shop in Europe. That's one thing I would like to know. The second thing is just a, a devil's seat I would like to place in everybody's mind, and that is, I hear we talk about funding gaps in certain strategies, but we need 130 trillion euros to get to Glasgow net finance in 2050. We're about at 100 trillion world GDP today. We need to grow by 3% compound annual growth for the next 25 years to just get those 130 trillion dollars. We haven't paid for defense, which Putin likes to hear, that we haven't paid for defense. We haven't paid for healthcare, right? So we need to take it out of capital stock. Now, capital stock is certainly more than 200, 300, 400, 600 trillion dollars. But over the last 10 years, it's been asset inflation. Most is bound in real estate. So we just don't have enough money to get to net zero. Mm -hmm. And when I have this discussion behind closed doors with very senior people, they all agree. But if you say publicly, then of course it's a bit of a depressive scenario. And I think the only way out of this is that we have purchase program based funding which doesn't care about whether you're in TRL 4 to 6 because the private capital that gets into TRL past 6 when it is scaled, when it is scaled up, it's de-risked, that's easy. I come from this world, it's, it's easy, right? The capital that goes into TRL 1 to 4, that's easy as well because it's university money, so it, if, if, it's, if it goes down the drain, we don't, we don't feel it. So I think the only way that we can fund that the difficult decisions that we have to make for TRLs four to six is through purchase programs that, yeah. for instance, the generation of my son, eight and year old, decides to buy a service or product that is associated with a certain purchase program, and how this is how we can fund that. Thank you, sir. Um, and a third question, and then we will come back. There's somebody here towards the center. Thank you. Two quick ones? Sure. Okay. Um, Promise they're quick. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my name is Julius. I'm with a German biochar carbon removal company. And since, from what I'm seeing, Horizon and all the funding uh, programs are mainly focused on CCS based CDR um, technologies, how we can make sure to have it uh, more tech neutral? Uh, I think mm -hmm. mine's quite linked actually to Julius's question, probably uh, directed to Philippe. Um, I have a, just a question about uh, practical implementation and techn technology um, agnosticity. Um, just in terms of implementation of methodologies and rollout for the CRCF, um, what we're seeing is even though there will be a plan laid out with different a time frame for working out protocols for each tech area, we already have clients who are ahead of the game and only will really want CRCF accredited uh, credits in the early days, they're going to wait for those. So we're seeing a de facto challenge with technology agnosticity, just given the sort of sheer timing. So I think linked Julius's really quick follow up one. Sorry, um, nice. just around soil carbon. Um, I used to work in soil carbon, and one of the major challenges around MRV was the sheer cost to landowners and farmer and farmers to actually carry out that monitoring. In the UK, we're working on different methods, perhaps, to drive pace in soil carbon. So are you so fixed necessarily on the MRV, or do you have to look at uh, action and activity-led financing as well? So just two from me. Yeah, thank you. Sorry. Um, we'll stop for now. If we have more time, we're going to go back to the audience. Um, maybe we'll start with your room. Quite a lot of questions there. Um, yeah. yeah, I think funding is very popular here. Um, yeah, uh, one, the first question, if I understood right, how can we speed up and, uh, and the difficulty of red tape? I think for Horizon Europe, uh, we work, of course, with uh, coalitions of partners in, in a project. So by nature, you have, if you have 10 partners or more, that takes time to, uh, to, to get a grant agreement together, as we call it. But we have outsourced everything to an agency, which 
gives a lot more specialization and focus to the whole process. So the time to grant, as we call it, has decreased over the years already. But there is not more that I, that I can do or that we can do from that perspective so much on, on the issue of the, the pre-seed to seed, the, the difficulty of the process. Horizon Europe may not be the best program then. We also have the, the, uh, the Innovation Council, which is structured in a way where you can go from for single researcher from the pathfinder to the transition to the accelerator. So it's not working with large consortia. It's, it's much more geared towards SME, so that may be a, a, better, a better program. Uh, on the second question, if I understood well, the, 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 it came back to how can we, for US-based companies, uh, access European funding. Uh, now, this is, of course, uh, logically not always possible. I mean, it's open to the world. Uh, Horizon Europe is open to the world, to, to, uh, with a few exceptions here and there for China. Um, but for industrialized countries, uh, it's clear they have to bring their own money because we're not going to pay in principle for, uh, for US partners unless they are absolutely necessary in a program, which is not always the case. So just uh, having access to European funding, uh, difficult through Horizon Europe. Um, that's all I can say. Thank you. Uh, I think Lee, you wanted to react to that as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I want to comment on two issues. Um, thank you so much for the comment on capital constraints and what the transition is expected to cost. I think a lot of times people throw out the IEA number three trillion a year, which is only double twice as much, but actually it's going to be much more expensive. And this brings me back to R&D because I think this geopolitically induced notion of industrial policy that every country has, or every, you know, in with the within the EU, of course the EU has to be the leader on everything, that's not going to work out. We have to work with our um, allies, for lack of a better word, on understanding where do we actually have a competitive advantage in some technologies and what supply chains can we source from whom in the most efficient, most cost beneficial way. As we said earlier, not every CDR option is going to work everywhere. And there might be huge cost differentials if you really plan and think through where what works the best way, including the cost of electricity, land, and so on. And so I just want to caution that we actually should be using R&D money to understand those conditions, those ecosystem conditions very judiciously to then plan and systematically deploy CDR. So we're achieving, we're achieving it at a systems cost that is lowest because the transition is going to be so expensive. The other piece, um, the other question was about MRV first. I think if we really want to make sure that the CDR sector has the credibility that it needs to be considered a long-term solution, we want to be very, very careful of, of MRV. And that's why we think the CRCF actually is the most important first step um, to complement voluntary markets and to set a standard of um, what really qualifies as a removal. Because otherwise, um, it will just end up in a hype cycle um, and then we'll lose credibility, not just in the market, but also from the public. And that's the worst thing I think we can all agree here that we want to happen for climate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lee. Any other reactions to those questions? Uh, maybe Philippe uh, or Megan? Yep. I don't know. You have to talk to me baby language because you mentioned some like CRCF. Sorry, you know. Uh, if you don't explain me what this is, I will take even a stronger French accent. <laughs> what is it? So it's the carbon removal certification framework. Ah, okay. Yep. It's a co Sorry. kind of carbon crediting. Yeah. yeah, I can understand that, of course, MRV for, you know, ocean uh, and entry removal, soil carbon uh, is, is quite critical. It's also critical and even criticized for uh, forest uh, carbon projects. Uh, I think uh, I insist also on the importance of the M in MRV uh, because uh, a lot of land-based uh, CDR technologies have potential problems with non-permanence, like you have a disturbance event, fire, storms, whatever happens, you know, tillage for soil carbon, and you may lose all the carbon you have patiently gained before. So having uh, 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 something that can monitor over time, you know, the evolution of carbon as an asset uh, in the land or the ocean is uh, particularly uh, important. 
because a lot of uh, insurance systems are based on this. Huh? Like you make a project and then you take a provision for possible losses, like 5, 10%, whatever. But we need to consider that the risk uh, due to climate change is not uh, stationary. So you can make a provision with a 5% carbon loss when you plant a forest, but maybe, you know, in 20 years, the climate risk will make it 10 or 20%. So that's very important to include in the CDR, you know, MRV system, the kind of uh, uh, climate uh, increased exposure huh, of uh, carbon assets. Thank you very much. Maybe we can take one more question from the audience. I don't know if there's... Yes, please. Um, my colleague will be there with you in a second. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> John Philip Wassenaar from uh, Nature Credit. On the MRV side of things, there's, um, a, there's thousands of projects of people that are doing uh, carbon removal projects. They all have these big PDFs in a cupboard. And one of the problems we have is, is you don't really have the access to that data. So there's a lot of new technology coming up, eDNA, remote sensing, and all these kind of things, but you have no data to calibrate that stuff. Do you see well, maybe something for the EU, or create a European data warehouse for CDR measurements? So at least you can R&D will have access to data. Thank you very much. Um, anyone with a reaction to this? Yep, please. I think that's an excellent idea that you should probably think about in this as your agenda setting the CDR strategy. But um, R and D again important for those technologies, making them as efficient and as impactful, um, and of course creating those data sets. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Unfortunately, we don't have more time for questions, so we'll move to concluding remarks. And here, the floor is back to you, uh, our esteemed speakers. What would be the main thing that you would like people in this room to go home with thinking about? And it can be funding related, it can be beyond funding, anything CDR related. If it would be one thing, what it, would it be? And maybe we can start with you, Jeroen, indeed. Uh, for, for me, the, the message would be that the bottom line for everything that we do is that it will require enormous amounts of renewable energy. So that is for me the bottom line. We need more renewable energy, and uh, this require, this should be on top of the list, and that's part of the Green Deal as well. Thank you. Um, I think the key things, if I'm thinking about an EU strategy, what, what do we really desperately need? It's a very clear vision. It's targets that are set out and adjusted as we reduce so that we're not over um, amplifying the need for removals. Um, it's a easy and accessible way for the private sector to play in the same schools, especially at this early stage in the market as removals, uh, as, uh, as the public sector, and a very clear bridge, a clear roadmap from today, small scale VCM action to large scale commodity use market. How is it actually going to work? And then let the market choose the technologies. Make sure you invest across a wide range of methodologies, but the market will choose and should be market run. Thank you. Yeah, from this panel, I would say R&D isn't just the beginning. Um, but in general, I think you know, ma ensuring that we're thinking about the ecosystem, that we're still prioritizing mitigation as soon as possible, because that's what it's really about. The sooner we can reduce emissions, the better our chance at fending off the worst effect of climate change. And then um, also, I think in general as a community, being really judicious about not feeding a hype cycle, but being honest about the scalability, about the limitations and advantages of some solutions over others. I think um, that's what I would like to see. Thank you, Lee. Yeah, uh, I regret not to have been in the session uh, upstairs because uh, my main message is that somehow we know that we will only solve the global climate crisis globally by talking to large emitters like China, India, and so on. And those countries uh, will only do mitigation at scale together with other countries if uh, it helps them to raise the income of people and alleviate poverty. So I would like to think about how CDR can be part of a new thread between the North and the South dialogue, which is so tense at the moment, because a lot of CDR opportunities like, uh, lie in, in the Global South, in particular, 
uh, related to land-based and maybe ocean-based uh, opportunities. Thank you so much, and that was a brilliant link made to the panel that is happening now upstairs on the justice-centered uh, approach to CDR. You're here, but it will be online for you to follow after the event. I really encourage you to, to follow that because it's an important pillar of our strategy as well. And my colleague Kayla has done a tremendous job in developing that part. Uh, thank you so much again. A round of applause for our speakers.